Today, let us study the Word of God with the sermon titled, What has the greatest value in heaven? Everyone, we first need to realize the value of our faith. Only then can we have a greater and stronger faith that serves as an example to others. Rather, if we don't understand the value of our life of faith, we only copy the actions of others. By doing this, our faith will never produce a good result. I recall sharing the following story with you once before. In the animated film, The Prince of Egypt, there was a quote that is noteworthy. A lick of gold in the desert sand is less than a cool, fresh spring. And to one lost sheep, a shepherd boy is greater than the richest king. Greater here means more valuable. With respect to social position, isn't a king's position greater and more valuable than others? Yes, it is much greater. However, to a lost sheep, a shepherd who can guide their way is more valuable than a powerful king. When we consider what makes something valuable, we must take into account that its value can be changed by the environment. Thus, what is valuable in a desert and what is valuable in a comfortable and safe environment differ from each other. While living on earth, people place greater value on things like gold, power, and fame, chasing after them. However, wouldn't what they deemed valuable change when they enter the kingdom of heaven? Recently, a situation broke out between the United States and North Korea. Wasn't the conflict so intense that they were ready to launch missiles and attack each other? In that situation, what would be the most viable commodity if a war breaks out? If a nation goes to war, money becomes nothing but a worthless piece of paper. People begin to buy precious metals, such as gold. The price of gold begins to rise rapidly. Although people regard gold as something valuable, according to Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 18, God said, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. There is a great difference between what people regard as valuable on earth and what is valuable in heaven. A rich man died and stood before God on Judgment Day. Using his life savings, he bought a large quantity of gold and wanted to bring it with him to heaven. So he earnestly pleaded with God, saying, I worked hard all my life, and I left a lot of gold back on earth. Please allow me to bring it to heaven. Because the man was asking so earnestly, God granted his wish. With all his strength, the man dragged all the gold he had gathered with him to heaven. But what did he find when he arrived? The streets in heaven were paved with pure gold. In heaven, gold was nothing more than a piece of stone used for paving roads. But he had wasted all his life for something that was so worthless. Gold was something so common in heaven that even the streets were covered with it. So he regretted devoting all his life and youth for something so worthless. As we can see, what is viable on earth is different from what is viable in heaven. Doesn't the Bible say that our time on earth is temporary? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. This is how the Bible describes the span of human life. Let us take a look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Just as man is destined to die once, this means that everyone will face death. People act as if they will live forever on earth until they die. This is the problem. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that, what will they face? To face judgment. After judgment, we cannot help but enter one of two places, heaven or hell. 
In order to go to heaven, we need to do what is valuable while we are still on earth. In the Bible, it is written that everyone will die and face judgment at some point. To save us from the judgment of hell, God came down to this earth. Didn't God come a second time to redeem us from our sins and take us to heaven? In the desert, water is more valuable than gold. To a lost sheep, a shepherd is more valuable than a king. People value different things depending on their situation. Rather than focusing on what is considered valuable during this temporary life on earth, let us pursue what is truly valuable and eternal and can lead us to heaven. Let us look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But only what will stand forever? The word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, flowers, grass, and glory are mentioned. However, all these things will wither away and disappear. What about the Word of God? It will stand and endure forever and ever. Some people say, even those who don't believe in God are well off, living in affluence with great authority. But their glory lasts a short moment like the blink of an eye. In the eternal kingdom where we will live, such things are not considered valuable at all. Suppose a man is trying to cross the desert with what he regards as valuable, a piece of gold. However, what if halfway into the journey he has no food to eat or water to drink? What can the piece of gold do for him at that moment? In this case, a sip of water would be much more valuable than a heavy piece of gold. Through the book of 1 Peter, we ought to correctly understand what has the greatest value and is considered precious in heaven. Through the Bible, God awakens us to understand how valuable heaven truly is so we can prepare to live in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Since the glory of this world is like grass and flowers, we must hold on to God's Word. Now let's understand how powerful the Word of God is by going to Numbers chapter 21, verse 5. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. The miserable food refers to manna, the food which God rained down from heaven for 40 years. At first, they regarded it as an amazing miracle. In the middle of the desert, there was no food. But God rained down food for 40 years. It was miraculous, and the Israelites were astonished by it. It was not a small amount. It was enough to feed more than three million people. At first, the manna was so precious and sweet to them that they said it tasted like wafers made with honey. However, soon after, in Numbers 21, they called it miserable food. It's because they ate it every day for 40 years. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. 
Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Here we can find a very important lesson. While traveling in the desert for 40 years, many Israelites died being bitten by venomous snakes. They pleaded with Moses saying, We sinned and this calamity has now come upon us. Pray that God will save us. God had mercy on them and gave this command to Moses. Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and I'll open the way for him to live. Moses delivered God's word exactly as God said. We need to take a close look at this scene in the desert which took place during the 40-year journey of the Israelites. There were two groups of people. One group valued only what was visible, declaring, that bronze snake saved us. However, in reality, the bronze snake did not have any power to heal anyone. Literally, it was just a snake made of a piece of bronze. It could not affect people's lives in any way. What saved the Israelites was the Word of God. Whoever looks at it will live. Nevertheless, the Israelites neglected God's Word and began to worship the bronze snake as their God. Let us continue with 2 Kings chapter 18. When we study about what happened in history, we will find an answer to the question, what is the most viable thing in the kingdom of heaven? 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. In the third year of Hosea, son of Allah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. What did the Israelites do? Burning incense means that they had offered sacrifices. In other words, they are worshipping the bronze snake as a god. What did Hezekiah do? He broke it into pieces. It was called Nehushtan. In the time of the kings of Israel, 800 years after Moses made the bronze snake, the Israelites continued worshipping the bronze snake even until then. Because God is spirit, he is invisible. Yet, when they looked at the visible bronze snake, their wounds from the snake bites were healed and the poison was neutralized. The Israelites thought, the bronze snake is truly powerful and began to worship it as their god. Here, the problem is that they took the word of God lightly when he said, whoever looks at it will live. It was not the bronze snake that opened the way to life for them, but the word of God. We ought to obey and live exactly according to the words given to us by God. Isn't this the wisest and correct way to live our lives on the earth? Let's go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. This book means the Bible. If anyone adds anything to them, meaning, if anyone adds anything to the Bible, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away, in other words, subtracts anything from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Since doing what is written in the Bible 
holds the greatest value. God told us not to add nor take away from it according to our own discretion. We must believe whatever God said or prophesied to be true. As it is written in Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10, God, who knows the end from the beginning, paved this path to lead mankind to salvation. This is why mankind should correctly understand its value and live a life in obedience to the words of God. We can enter the kingdom of heaven only when we do this. Isn't this what God is trying to teach us? Let us take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands I give you today, what will God do? The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. Everyone, who in the world do people consider to be a distinguished person? Would it be someone who graduated from Harvard University? Would it be someone who graduated from Oxford University? Since people of the world place value on these things, they believe the most distinguished person would come from places such as these. However, neither Jesus nor Apostle Peter came from such backgrounds. It is written that the ones who be set high above all nations are those who obey God and carefully follow all His commands. Verse 2 All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Since the Word of God holds great authority and has amazing and miraculous power, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and eating trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. When we obey the word of God, we'll be set high above all nations. Those who absolutely believe this teaching and obey it know the value of God's word. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, the zither, lyre, a harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse 6, Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. In the Bible, it is written, You shall have no other gods before me. One of the Ten Commandments says, Do not worship idols. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all believed in God. They were all brought before the king since they had not worshipped a statue he had set up. Verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, 
flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? The king gave them another chance because he had high regard for them. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They did not need to defend themselves. The value of what God can offer us is incomparable to what any king can offer us on this earth. Ask yourself whether we should follow God's command or the king's command. Verse 17. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and He will rescue us from your hand, O King. But even if He does not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. A furnace was used for melting metals like iron. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. To these three men, the words of God, who is the King of Kings, were much more important and valuable than anything else. No matter how much we try to extend our temporary lives on earth, sooner or later we will all die. The days of our life on earth are few. It is just like a blink of an eye. They understood this principle of life and valued the things of heaven, saying, We absolutely cannot do what God has commanded us not to. The king tried to convince them otherwise. But since they didn't change their mind, he threw them into the furnace. The soldiers who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace were killed by the flames. But the three men were not harmed by the fire, nor was a single hair on their heads singed. What is important to note is that the three men understood the value of the kingdom of heaven. What did they value the most? The words of God. They always paid attention to what God said. As a result, they were respected by other officials and even became high-ranking officials in Babylon. It is extremely rare that a king would appoint his captives as his officials. Just as all the forefathers of faith did not waver in that situation, I'm sure you and I would do the same. From Genesis to Revelation, we can find numerous records of those who stood on God's side throughout any circumstance. God has taught us to obey and follow the words of God keeping the Sabbath day and the Passover while living on this earth. Those who are guided by the Word will be set high above all nations. After leading peoples of all nations to the way of salvation, won't they shine bright forever like the stars in eternal heaven? Let us see another verse in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. 
I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It says disciples here, but in John 12, it was Judas Iscariot who thought the perfume was wasted. John 2 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Here we have two contrasting figures, Mary and Judas Iscariot. Mary knew very well that Jesus Christ was God, who came to earth to save mankind. Her sister Martha also knew that very well. This is why Jesus cherished and loved Mary's household. At that time, a denarius was given for one day of labor. Since the cost of the perfume was 300 denarii, it was worth a year's wages. When Mary poured this perfume on Jesus' feet, Judas Iscariot felt it went to waste and thought to himself, if we calculate the cost of the perfume, it is worth a lot of money. Judas Iscariot greatly valued the perfume, thinking about its momentary value. On the other hand, Mary poured it out, considering that it is worth, paled in comparison with Jesus Christ. When we do something, we should always ask ourselves, Am I doing this thinking of the value of heaven? Or am I only thinking of the glory of this world? We must become those who always think about the value of heaven. What then holds the greatest value in heaven? If we were to summarize all the teachings of the Bible, it is to obey and live according to God's word. According to the Bible and the prophets, this is the best way to store up blessings in heaven. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. If you carefully follow all His commands, God will set you high above all the nations on earth. The glory of this earth is temporary and will soon disappear. But what about the glory of heaven? It will last forever and ever. All brothers and sisters in Zion, let us always reflect upon what is considered as valuable on earth and what is considered as valuable in heaven and correctly understand why we should live according to the Word of God. I earnestly hope you will give more glory, thanks, and honor to God on this blessed day. Hoping that you would receive much grace, I would like to conclude this sermon. Thank you very much.